although it's a battleship, it actually looks a bit like a liner. Could easily be mistaken for that. Uh, it's a unique wreck, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while. And it's the story of a tragic naval blunder, and um, one that uh, the Royal Navy is usually pretty embarrassed about. So, why is it a unique vessel? Okay, well, it's a pre-dreadnought battleship. What this means is it's, a, it, it's an intermediate step between the evolution of battleship design or warship design from the three-decker wooden ships of the line of the Napoleonic, Napoleonic era through to the, um, to, to the modern 20th century battleship. It was built by Armstrong Whitworth at the Ellswick Yard in Tarn Tyneside, and it was laid down in 1883, launched in 87, commissioned into the Royal Navy in 1890, and sunk on the 22nd of June 1893. So it actually only had, what, three years, just over three years in service. Not a long life. <clears throat> so she was a Victoria class battleship. Um, there are only two, Victoria and Sans Perel. She was originally going to be called Renown. And indeed, I've got uh, copies of the original um, drawings, um, shipyard drawings for her, and they, they have Renown all over them. She was uh, at a fairly late stage in the build that was changed to Victoria because of the to honour the Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. She was somewhat innovative in that she was the first British battleship with triple expansion engines, which increased her range and speed um, and um, was much more efficient. She was also the first with a steam turbine, albeit that that was only driving a generator. Those are her stats. She was 11, just over 11,000 tonnes um, displacement. To put that into perspective, her predecessor, a wooden HMS Victoria, um, which I'll show you a little bit later, was the largest wooden battleship that was ever produced, and that was just under 7,000 tonnes. Uh, okay. Um, seem to be getting doing things under the under the radar there. Okay, she had an armor, armor plating, 18-inch uh, armor plating band around about the waterline. Uh, and below the waterline, but it only extended to the middle two thirds of the ship. So the very front and the very back didn't have it. She weighed 8,000 indicated horsepower with the boilers on natural draft and nearly 14,500 indicated horsepower with the boilers on forced draft. And that translated into a speed of 16 knots um, on natural draft and just one knot more on forced draft. Armament, right, she had two 16 and a quarter inch guns. They were the largest guns uh, available in the world. They were um, Armstrong Whitworth guns. Uh, a little bit more about them in a, in, in a minute. But they were mounted in a rotating turret on the uh, foredeck. She had a 10 inch um, gun with a limited um, radius of fire on the stern, which was behind a, a screen. She had 12 six-inch guns. They're all, all these guns are breech loaders, um, uh, but the six-inch guns were um, arranged a bit like the old um, ships of the line in gun ports facing outwards with a very limited angle of fire. And then she had nine six-pounders and 12 three-pounders arranged around the decks. And she had six 14-inch torpedo tubes, four on the foredeck and two on the stern. And then she had a main armament, a battering ram. So this thing was um, a steel battering ram welded onto the um, onto the bows, a bit like a bulbous bow they have these days and filled with concrete. And the idea was that you used the main guns to uh, subdue the opposition and then you uh, sunk it by ramming it. The fact that this hadn't happened since the 1700s seemed to have, uh, was beyond the Admiralty, but this was the theory anyway, I'm told. 
So this was a period of intense innovation in shipbuilding design. So 1805 saw the Battle of Trafalgar, and that was um, Nelson's flagship, the Victory. Wooden, wooden ship, uh, three decks, three gun decks, guns pointed all outwards, under sail, um, so limited maneuverability, and the range of the guns was probably, effective range was probably less than 200 yards or 200 meters. So <clears throat> the idea was that you put it alongside the enemy and you pounded away until one gave up. Um, and the rate of fire was um, the key thing. Uh, so the British rate of fire was roughly three times the French and Spanish in, in Trafalgar. So probably a large part of why they won. <clears throat> so move on to 1859. So less than 50 years later, and we've still got wooden ships. This, this is HMS Victoria, the predecessor to the one we're, we're discussing. And it's still wood, and it's still got um, muzzle-loaded cannons facing outwards. It's still got the sails. It does have a steam engine, um, and that's about the only uh, tip towards modernity. So then we move on less than 30 years, and you've got a completely different animal in HMS Victoria. It's iron and steel. It has a rotating turret where you can uh, aim the main armament through around about 200 degrees. Um, it has steam engines and, um, and, and, and no sails. It's all steam propulsion. And we'll move on to 1906. The um, HMS Dreadnought is, um, it comes into service. That is the quintessential, quintessential 20th century battleship. Um, not only did it have steam turbine propulsions, which massively reduced its consumption and increased its range and speed, but it also was able to aim all of its main armament uh, at the same time and concentrate that fire on an enemy, which hadn't been the case before and was quite critical in range finding um, with guns that could now shoot almost to the horizon. So that's in what, 50 years? It's a massive move forward in battleship design. Battleships of course were short lived because by the end of the second world war, they were pretty much obsolete anyway. So as you might expect in this period of um, great innovation, there were design faults. It's Got to be a bit of trial and error. And the biggest Achilles heel was the 16 and a quarter inch guns. The barrels weighed 110 tons each and the turret weighed just over 200 tons. So you got 450 tons approximately sitting on the foredeck. Um, this meant they, it had to be very um, mounted quite low um, so that the uh, stability was kept. Um, to a good range. Uh, the reason they went for the 16 and a quarter inch guns rather than the standard Admiralty 13 and a half inch guns was because the Italian Navy had ordered a ship to be built, again on Tyneside, a new battleship, and they'd specified the 16 and a quarter inch guns from Armstrong Whitworth. And the Admiralty at the late stage in Victoria's build said, we can't have the uh, Italians having um, bigger guns than we've got. So they redesigned at a very late stage in the build to, to accommodate these things. So the ship wasn't designed for these 16 and a quarter inch guns. Um, they, they had a range of, of only about a mile. Um, at 75 rounds, the barrel was completely scrap. Um, and if they fired both barrels together, they had a tendency to buckle the deck. So you can see why they thought the battering ram was probably the better option. But having all that weight on it meant that the turret had to be um, pretty much a midshifts. So you can see it there on that photograph there, just sitting in front of the bridge. Um, it also had to be mounted quite low for stability. That meant that the bow had to be quite low, otherwise you end up shooting your own bow off. Um, and that meant it was a very wet boat. 
and it was known for that. In, in fairly reasonable conditions, it would take water over the um, over the bows. And it had watertight bulkheads, but they were longitudinal instead of athwart ships. They're, they're, they're sitting fore and aft. And the problem with that is if you get hold, if you um, get the main hold, hold, oh. if you get the main hull hold, then all that water stays on the one side. And rather than just sinking slowly, it'll capsize or has a tendency to capsize. So let's talk about what actually happened. Um, at 3.44 on 30 the 22nd of June, 1893, the fleet, the, um, the Mediterranean fleet, Royal Navy's Mediterranean fleet, was on manoeuvres off Tripoli, which in those days was in, was in Syria. It's now just inside Lebanon. It was in collision with HMS Camperdown. Camperdown is another pre slightly older pre-Dreadnought battleship. And um, basically, Camperdown rammed Victoria, and, um, and that's how she sank. 359 men lost their lives on it, including the admiral in charge, who went down with his ship. 284 were saved, including a... Um, a lieutenant commander who'd been in the sick bay who was told to abandon ship at the last minute and stepped off just as she was going, stepped off the deck just as she was rolling over. That was um, John, John Jellico, who later became the Admiral of the Grand Fleet at the Battle of Jutland. HMS Camperdown is, a, as you can see, a very similar ship, um, slightly different design. The funnels are fore and aft rather than athwart ships. But generally speaking, pre pre um, pre dreadnought, slightly smaller, uh, had steam, compound steam engines rather than um, triple expansion. It had the standard naval thirteen and a half inch guns mounted in a rotating turret, and I think you can see that's raised quite a bit higher on that that one there. And then it had four six inch guns, twelve six pounders, ten three pounders and five tor torpedo tubes. So not dissimilar. And of course, the battering ram. They all had them. Now, both ships were part of the Mediterranean fleet. Yeah, they were the um, flagship and, uh, and the second in charge. And it guarded the vital sea route between Britain and India. It consisted of eight battleships, three dreadnoughts and three large cruisers, plus destroyers, and, and support ships. Victoria was the flagship and the under the command of Vice Admiral Sir George Tryon, KCB. And the captain was the Honourable Morris Archibald Burke. Now, I'm not quite sure about the pronunciation, that pronunciation of that. It might be Burke, in which case it's probably um, probably unfortunate considering what followed. So let's look at the main content uh, participants in this because it's quite important uh, as to why this thing happened. Um, George Tryon uh, is of Irish descent. Um, he was considered the most gifted and scientific of senior officers of his day. Um, he believed in exercising his fleet with ever, com ever more complex manoeuvres to keep them on the toes and keep them up to scratch. Uh, and he would give them minimum information to get the commanders to, um, to act on initiative. He invented a thing, a system of signaling he called the T system. And with signaling was not, there was no radio, so they had to do it with flags, semaphores, and, uh, and lights flashing um, lanterns. So the idea was that this signaling system was, was minimum, minimum signals and the, um, the senior commanders should know what they're expected to do and they should, they should use their own initiative. Unfortunately, as you can see from that photo, I think, he's a very imposing personality. 
it would seem that he was taciturn. Um, he um, he was taciturn, um, very erudite, but even to the point of being rude. And not so much he didn't suffer fools gladly, he just didn't suffer them at all. And pretty much considered everybody but himself a fool. So consequently, following their initiative wasn't popular amongst his senior officers. The other character in this unfolding tragedy is uh, Albert Hastings Markham, who was the um, Vice Admiral. Um, he's one rank lower at Rear Admiral, and he's, he's on the flagship HMS Camperdown. So he's the second in command of the fleet. He's a career officer and he's a good team player. I think if you look at that photograph there, what seems to shine out is a sort of benign academic um, rather than uh, a military commander. So let's look at what happened. On the evening of the 21st of June, 1893, the fleet was at, at, at anchor and moored in Beirut Harbour and Tryon was hosting a dinner on board the flagship Victoria for the senior captains. And they actually discussed what they were going to do the following day because they were planning to do fleet manoeuvres off Tripoli, um, which is to the north of Beirut by about 80 miles. So they discussed those plans and it was pointed out that there was an error in Tryon's plans and that was to do with the battleship's turning circle. And maximum rudder, emergency rudder, gave a radius of four cables. A cable is a tenth of a nautical mile, or approximately 220 yards. But they had to use tactical rudder on all fleet manoeuvres. They weren't allowed to use maximum rudder. And that was six cables. And it was subsequently said that maybe, maybe Tryon had got mixed up between radius and diameter, but nevertheless. That was, the, that was the key thing. They were going to use six cable radius. Okay. So on the following morning, they left Beirut Harbour at um, 10 o'clock and the fleet steamed north and arrives off Trifoli at approximately three o'clock in the afternoon and they take up position off the um, waterfront of Tripoli. And they're going to do this complex fleet manoeuvre uh, with all the, the big wigs and the great and the good of um, uh, of Tripoli standing watching. And when it's finished, they all get invited onto the flagship for dinner and uh, have a good old time. So Admiral Tryon, once they've got into position, orders a signal to be hoisted. And that signal is form columns of divisions, line ahead, columns disposed of beam to port six cables apart. Effectively, that's what it looked like. You've got HMS Victoria leading the right-hand column um, with the, the other five um, pre-dreadnoughts behind it, and HMS Camperdown leading the left-hand column with four more dreadnoughts behind her. And they're six cables apart, and they're steaming away from the waterfront at approximately 8.8 .8 knots. So this is the start of the manoeuvre, and they're six cables apart. So, at 15.27 hours, try and orders this signal to go up in flags in semaphore. Second Division Alter Course 16 points to starboard, preserving the order of the fleet. First Division Alter Course 16 points to starboard, preserving the order of the fleet. The point of the compass is 11 and a quarter degrees, so 16 points is 180 degrees. So basically, they're going to turn inwards and come back from uh, come back again to face um, to face the waterfront, and then the plan is that when they reach there at some at a given point, a signal will be given, and they all turn to starboard and anchor for the night. And the key part of that that, that uh, order is preserving the order of the fleet. So that it it transpired at the later courts martial. Uh, the senior captains, including Burke, were um, confused about what should have happened. And there were two versions um, given. One was that this should have happened, that it should have turned inwards, gone back, turned starboard at some point, and anchored for the night. 
But that was clearly impossible because of the six cables when they needed greater than 12 cables between them. The other version was this one, where the two would turn inwards and then they would dovetail. So Victoria would go outside of the, the other line and the, the, the other pre dreadnought to the first division would follow suit. And then they would come down and then turn to starboard and anchor for the night. And I think what you can see there is that that's preserved the order of the fleet in that Victoria is still leading the right-hand column and Camperdown still the left-hand column. So that was probably what should have happened. Who knows? So <clears throat> the problem was that six cables. Um, the order was given. Um, at first, Markham um, hesitated, and after a while, he was chivied with um, try and send a signal, what are you waiting for? And Markham, being the um, team player he was, started the manoeuvre. So there we have it. They started the manoeuvre, and effectively, this happened. Uh, Camperdown collided with Victoria. Now, when it became apparently um, Bork asked three times um, of Tryon if he could take avoiding action. Most, most of the sen senior uh, commanders seemed to think that Tryon had got something up his sleeve and would give a, an order at the last minute. On the third attempt, Tryon realised that there was a collision was inevitable and uh, ordered Bork to put the, sh the ship into harder stern. Markham Main did exactly the same, at the, more or less the same time, but only put it in half a stern. So you've got a catalogue of errors there. So at 15.43 hours, approximately, HMS Camperdown rammed HMS Victoria. About 10 foot above the anchor hawse pipe, and at an angle of about 68 degrees. And the key thing about that is that that was in front of where the 18-inch armour band, so it's a vulnerable position. And Camperdown dug a great big hole into the starboard side of Victoria. Now, both ships were still in a stern propulsion, so Camperdown withdrew. So HMS uh, Victoria then had a great gaping hole in a starboard bow, and water was pouring in. The ship's crew tried to get a, um, a collision mat over the side to reduce the flow, but by the time they'd got it ready, this thing again. by the time they'd got it ready, they were the bows were already underwater. Victoria was running for shore at seven knots, hoping that they could um, they could beach her, and. Um, but unfortunately, after 10 and a half minutes, Victoria capsized and rolled over and sank. And that's an um, artist's illustration of um, her doing just that. And of course, all the water being held in the starboard side would cause that to roll over and capsize. And that's a photograph that was taken at the time from one of the other ships. And I think you can see, if you look closely, there's loads of guys um on the on on the ship's hull the props are still turning because the engine room hadn't been stood down and the the ship went down by the head uh and with pulled down by all the weight of that uh, massive turret and she's uh, and all of uh, a load of those guys got chopped up by the props Tryon went down with the ship and he was heard saying several times on the bridge that it was all his fault. And that was brought out at the court's martial. So, why is it a unique wreck? Well, a wreck, wrecks that we're familiar with tend to look like that. That's SS, um, SS Leopoldsville. Um, they're either on the side, they're upright, or they're upside down, as in the case of um, the repulse and the Prince of Wales. Victoria doesn't look like that at all. It looks like that. It's vertical. Uh, it's completely vertical, unsupported. It's leaning on nothing. It's just absolutely, you can't see a list on it at all. 
The stern is pretty much at exactly 77 metres. Uh, the seabed is between 144 and 146, depending on how accurate your computer is and the, and the sounder. Uh, about 30 metres of the vessel, about a third of it, is embedded into the seabed. Uh, and it's, it's about to, to where the bridge would be, but it's, uh, it's gone into the seabed. And we think the forward gun turret is about 80 metres south of the wreck. We certainly picked up on the sounder a, um, a significant target in that position. Uh, I wasn't prepared to go for a swim on the seabed to, uh, to check it out, I'm afraid. Um, so, we flew in, in October, we flew to uh, Beirut, and we were met at the airport, the, the first group that were there for the first two weeks. Um, we met at the airport from, by the people from the, um, from the dive uh, shop and taken to the d dive center. And then we were told that all diving on the wreck had been banned. The Lebanese Armed Forces um, had banned it. Two dive centres were arguing over the who owned the wreck. And the Lebanese Armed Forces, who were pretty much engaged with Hezbollah and the Christian militia and, and Syrian forces up on the Syrian border, just took the easy way out and said, that's it, we'll ban it. So from there followed 11 days of meetings. Um, we had uh, meetings with the British military attache, Lieutenant Colonel Andrews, the Lebanese Armed Forces, the British MOD. Um, we were in contact with them back in London um, and we were getting pretty much nowhere. Uh, the whole thing was solved by patronage in the end because the guy who ran our dive centre, uh, Walid Moshe, he, shortly after meeting us, he cleared off to, um, to Dubai to do some deals. And after 10 days, he came back again, was uh, amazed that we hadn't got on the wreck. Um, he then invited General Cara to dinner. General Cara being the head of the Lebanese Armed Forces. And he happened to be a personal friend of his. And I believe the conversation went along the lines of, um, is it still banned? Yes. Um, what will you do to us if you find us out there? Well, we'll ask you to leave. Well, if we've got divers in the water, what will you do? Um, well, we'll wait till they surface and then we'll ask you to leave. Oh, you're going to be patrolling out there tomorrow? No. And that's the way it went. So I got a phone call from Walid at 10.30 at night and said, we're picking you up at, at uh, 3.30 in the morning to go to Tripoli. But we did do some stuff in, in those 11 days. We dived the SS Lesbian, um, which is a, um, a um, British ship that was uh, sunk as a block ship outside of um, Beirut Harbour. Um, it was a bit silty, not a bad dive, but uh, at least those blokes, those of us blokes, got the um, bragging rights of having been down on the uh, Beirut Lesbian. We dived the VT-8, which is a Vichy French supply ship, which supplied French submarines with, uh, with, with various supplies, including uh, torpedoes. And you can see the torpedoes on the deck of it. There was 13 of them, if I remember rightly. We dived the Alice B, um, which is in 38 metres. That was, um, that was a American ship that the um, Lebanese Christian militia blew up for the um, for the uh, insurance money. They made quite a bit of money out of that. And we dived a Russian freighter, which is off Tripoli, which was, again, silty, modern ship, but um, it was a dive. But we also dived the French, VC French submarine Souffleur, which is just off the, just uh, offshore of the end of the Beirut um, airport runway, and it's in 38 metres. Great little dive, it's in two parts. Um, as you can see there, it's um, really quite a nice dive. Big submarine was sunk by HMS Parthenon. You can see one of our group there has uh, got his head stuck in the torpedo loading hatch on the stern section. And uh, if you stuck your head in there, you could see there was a door to the engine room. And uh, one of our group, um, one of our 
intrepid in explorers uh, noticed that there was a light coming from inside the engine room um, flashing around. So he thought, well, somebody must be in there. So it must be convenient to get in and, uh, and have a look. So he entered and, um, and he went in, uh, struggled to get through the hatch, went into the engine room only to find a video camera and a pair of lights dangling from a hole in the uh, pressure hull. The, uh, the um, Nick Jusen was videoing it through that hole, dangling it on a string. I couldn't possibly tell you who that idiot was. But moving on, Lebanon has got a tremendous amount of heritage, uh, dating back to Greco-Roman times, and we went round and seen quite a bit of that, and I'm just going to flash through that. A little bit about Beirut. It's a very cosmopolitan city in the 50s and the 60s, and perhaps the 70s, the early 70s. It was the place where the international jet set set went for the winter, the European jet set. And that was the photograph I took in downtown Beirut. Um, and you can see it could be a, any Western city with lots of young people enjoying themselves. But you didn't have to go far to see the problems. And that was the remains of the um, hotel um, and the Holiday Inn, I think it was, and the bank next door to it, where the Prime Minister had been blown up uh, and assassinated just a few months before. And there were these military roadblocks all, all the way around Beirut. You didn't have to go far to find them. And once you got into the south of Beirut or up towards Tripoli, um, these rather intimidating posters of the various Hezbollah mullahs were all over the place, certainly in the middle of, of the roads and what have you. So let's get back to HMS Victoria. She's five nautical miles north of Tripoli. It's in modern day Lebanon, so it's right on the Lebanese Syrian border. And um, it was indeed, at the time of the accident, part of Syria. Uh, incidentally, that uh, those numbers, <clears throat> the um, I think it was the the Christian Francis claimed he'd found it. I don't think the Admiralty had ever lost it because their numbers were absolutely spot on. Their numbers they gave me. So there were special considerations of diving the wreck. Um, the logistics for a start, we had to send a pallet of Zorb out there, and Alex at um, Custom Divers did that for us. Uh, he was supposed to be on the trip, but unfortunately he got rather badly bent a few months before. Um, cylinders were a bit of a problem because it was in the early days of rebreathers for, certainly for Lebanon. Um, so we used various cylinders and you can see that um, Greg Marshall there is on his Meg and he's got seven litres on the side. Some of us had four or five litre cylinders and some of us had, there were a number of a standard three litre cylinders. The depth of the wreck meant that the original plan was that we would have half of the team diving the wreck and half of the team operating as support, deep and shallow support divers for each, each dive, and that we would dive on alternative days and swap the two teams. The local recompression facility really didn't exist for civilians. It was a one-man chamber that the Lebanese Armed Forces uh, operated and uh, you couldn't guarantee um, getting in it. There was no provision for, um, for, for transporting people there. So we basically had to um, plan on using in-water recompression if we had a problem. Fortunately, we didn't. Temperature was an issue. It was 29 degrees C in uh, six meters and 18 degrees on the wreck. So you went down several thermoclines as you went in. This meant some divers used um, dry suits and other divers used wet suits. It was a compromise. It's right at the eastern end of the Med, so dehydration is a problem. It's a hot climate. You need to drink plenty of water. And of course, with that comes the problem of urination. And certainly one of our group <clears throat> had a problem with the um, urination system that he was using, and it uh, leaked rather badly. And with about three and a half to four hours of decompression to do, as you can imagine, there was a certain amount, there was quite a fair amount of leakage. Um, he hung that uh, dry suit over the balcony of the hotel that night 
somewhat of an antisocial thing to do, I think. There were unforeseen considerations. One was travel. It's 80 kilometers from Beirut to Tripoli. If anybody can remember what the roads in Malta used to be like before they joined the European Union, the, uh, the roads in um, Lebanon were largely just as bad. Um, and certainly where there'd been explosions, there were uh, potholes that you, or bomb holes that you could lose the bus in. But we had to, we had to stay in Beirut because it wasn't safe to stay in Tripoli. It was too close to the Syrian border and too much Hezbollah activity. So every time we wanted to dive it, we had to go on this small coach. And by the time we put 12 divers kit in there and all the stage cylinders and all the rest of the gear we needed, there wasn't a lot of suspension travel left on that. So we were traveling for six, seven hours a day. The boats were slightly different to what we have in the UK. They're basically open speed boats, um, 13 meters long, so quite large, but you can see there's no kicking up benches there. And you just put everything down inside the, uh, inside the boat, as you can see there. And I think you can see down here, the um, diver ladder there. Uh, but actually what we did have on the boat was we have, we had a diver lift. It's this guy here. Now, Nassim, I think his name was, he was um, extremely strong and he could leave, lift a rebreather and then a diver out, uh, literally by the scruff of the neck with one hand. Um, gas mixing, pretty much um, gas mixing took quite a lot of time. With the traveling, we couldn't do the gas mixing on the same day that we'd done the dive. So we had to have, we could only dive the thing every other day. And then there were the Syrian fishermen. Now, Syrian fishermen have a novel way of fishing. Uh, they use dynamite. And what you got is this. The first time we dived it, this happened. Uh, I was inside, two decks in, inside the um, wardrobe pantry when the first bang went off and the shockwave hit me. And I rather thought one of those six-inch guns was coming down through it broke free off its, uh, off its mooring and was coming down through uh, until there was another bang and then another bang. Um, so we just had to put up with that one. Um, it, there, was a, uh, there was an upside to it. There was nobody suffered from constipation on that trip. So let's have a look at the wreck. It's a vertical, it's no current. There was 40 meters vis for most of the, most of the wreck. So we were, by the time the 11 days were up, we got four or five days left we could dive. Five, six dives, sorry, days left we could dive. So we decided that we could only dive it every other day. So we decided that we put all divers in together. The crew, uh, Nassim and Bassam Oud, who was the um, dive manager at the, uh, at the dive centre, he's got his own centre now um, out there, were... Um, Bassam was a diver and an instructor, so we could use the crew as surface support. Um, so that's what we did to get to dive the wreck. And the plan that we used was there was a permanent shot line on the wreck. Uh, we put a decompression station in and um, and, a tran and took a transfer line. We had to do this every dive. Um, took the transfer line in and put a press, press loop on it at 40 meters. We had a tagging system uh, um, so that it got um, got released when the last last pair came up. Didn't really need that because there was no tide on it at all. And we'd hang, hang two 11 liters of 80% on the, on, on the trapeze at, at uh, 10 meters, nine, 10 meters. Uh, we'd have an 11 of 20, 30 at 60 metres, and in the boat there would be two 11s of 80 and two 11s of 20, 30 to use as drop cylinders. The equipment we used um, were all, pretty much all buying one with rebreathers. Um, basically, we had one, um, one meg. Um, we had one... Mark V says Luna, Nick Jusen was using that, and everybody else was on variants of APs. We had some classics and some of the early visions on there. And we had somebody with some archaic equipment as well. 
one diver. Didn't spend much time down there. So we had common gases. Everybody used the same gases. Every rebreather dive used the same gases. The usual issues of oxygen toxicity, gas density, and nitrogen narcosis. Um, so we used 672 as the diluent, bottom diluent. We carried 1050 and 2030 as travel um, and bailout gases, and the 80% on the um, on the trapeze at nine meters was factored into our plans. So between the 4th and the 25th of October 2008, we had um, 16 divers in total. That was 12 on the first two weeks and uh, four on the last week. We actually got four whole days of diving on the Victoria during that time and, and uh, 31 individual dives. The, our deepest dive was 146 metres, and that was recorded by um, Francis Dewson. Francis got entered into the, I believe, got entered into the Guinness Book of Records as the deepest female rebreather diver at the time on the, on the back of that. The longest time of actually diving on the wreck was 48 minutes. Bear in mind, some of that was spent decompre uh, doing decompression stops because it's quite novel being able to do your deco stops while still diving the wreck. And the longest dive was six hours, 33 minutes. There were some extenuating circumstances on that. And we had three mild skin bends, which could just as easily have been put down to, um, down to suit squeeze. So that's the motley group that were involved, um, including the crew. That guy in the middle there is Nassim. He couldn't speak a word of English, and he was a Hezbollah member, but he was an absolutely great bloke. I think, if I remember rightly, this is the coach driver, and Bas Ahmad is there, and the rest of us were just the divers, and that was the bunch. So, that was the view that uh, loomed into, uh, into sight at around about 40, 45 metres, so we could see the stern. And that um, shows you the Admiral's walkway around the stern. You can see the brass letters Victoria, uh, which I think you can see there. And, um, and you can also see the Admiral, Admiral's uh, doorway out onto his walkway there and the flagpole right on the stern. So, OK, that's pretty much all the slides through. What I'd like to do now is um, show you about a seven minute video uh, which was taken and put together for show you what diving on the wreck was like. Beirut, Lebanon, October 2008. A team of divers, <coughs> led by Mike Rowley, prepare to dive HMS Victoria.
Um, hope you found it interesting. Um, I'm happy to take any questions.